Today we're going to look at an introduction of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. So let's start by looking at the author. Mark Twain's real name was Samuel Langhorne Clemens. He was born November 30th, 1835, the night that Halley's Comet flashed across the sky. Now, Halley's Comet appears about every 75 years, and it's the only comet in, in America, well, the only comet on the planet that is visible to the naked eye. Now, he grew up along the Mississippi River in Hannibal, Missouri, uh, and he quit school at age 12. Now, he died on April 21st, 1910, as Halley's Comet again flashed through the sky. Some of his more famous works include some travel books. He has written nonfiction, such as Life on the Mississippi, where he writes about his growing up and looking at and working on all of the riverboats. Um, he also writes about Innocence Abroad. He loved to travel, and so he's written quite a few travel books about Europe, about Egypt, and the other places that he's visited. He likes to write historic novels. You'll see The Prince and the Pauper and A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, uh, which do reflect his, his sense of royalty. Uh, he, does like, he did like writing about and learning about uh, English royalty. And then, of course, he has a lot of short stories as well. One of his most famous is known as the celebrated jumping frog of Calaveras County. Um, usually when you see his short stories, they're quite humorous and have a lot of exaggeration and a lot of Western dialect in them. But we're here to study the novel of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Well, it was written after The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Now, at the end of Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, a poor boy with a drunken father, and his friend, Tom Sawyer, a middle-class boy with an imagination too active for his own good, found a robber's stash of gold. Now, as a result of his adventure, Huck gained quite a bit of money, which, was, which the bank held for him in a trust. Now, he was taken in by the widow Douglas, a kind but stifling woman who lives with her sister, the self-righteous Miss Watson. And that's then where we start with the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. He's originally a character in Tom Sawyer. Tom Sawyer was a very famous novel at the time for, for Mark Twain. And so it was almost making a sequel. So Mark Twain described the major theme of the adventures of Huckleberry Finn as, quote, a sound heart and a deformed conscious come into collision and conscious suffers defeat. Well, a sound heart means a good and honest heart. So the, apparently uh, Huck is going to have a heart full of gold. But he also has a deformed conscience. Well, a conscience that is influenced by the laws of society and a sense of duty towards those laws, however unjust they may be. So the genre for Huckleberry Finn is a satiric novel. It is fiction, um, but it is satire. It's a work that uses humor, irony, and extreme exaggeration to ridicule society in order to bring about change. Now, your narrator and protagonist is going to be your title character, which is Huck Finn. Um, he's very practical, very realistic, and very literal. I mean, he is a child, so he's going to speak his mind. The setting, the time is before the American Civil War, roughly somewhere between the 1830s and 1840s, about 1835 to 1845. And the place, then we start off in the Mississippi River town of St. Petersburg, Missouri, but we do spend a lot of the book on the Mississippi River itself, and we continue down the Mississippi River into Arkansas. Some of the themes you'll be looking for in Huckleberry Finn uh, are the sense of racism and slavery, the sense of intellectual and moral education, and the hypocrisy of a civilized society. Let's start off with that idea of racial prejudice. Although written 20 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, America, and especially in the South, they were still struggling with the sense of racism and the after effects of slavery. Now, insidious racism arose near the end of Reconstruction, and we see once again the oppression of blacks for hypocritical and absolutely illogical reasons. So Twain decides in his own way through the sense of a satirical novel, through a satire, he exposes the hypocrisy of slavery and demonstrates how racism will distort oppressors as much as the oppressed, how everybody is in the wrong. And so, of course, the result is a world of moral confusion. 
So then we look into intellectual education and moreover with Huck, moral education. Huck is an uneducated boy. Uh, he distrusts the morals and precepts of society that treats him as an outcast. He thinks that he's doing everything correct and every time he tries to get into society, it seems like he doesn't fit in. Therefore, he distrusts that society. Now, Huck questions his teachings, especially regarding the ideas of race and slavery. Uh, because he has been an outcast, he talks to a lot of other outcasts, and he seems to get along with them quite well. Um, because of where he lives in the South, those people have a tendency to be a little more equitable. Um, sometimes they are even the enslaved, and so that's why he questions society. Now, in many instances, Huck chooses to, as he puts it, go to hell rather than to go along with the rules of society. And then lastly, our theme, the hypocrisy of civilized society. Now, civilized to Huck means things like regular baths and uncomfortable clothes. He doesn't like those things, and so therefore, why be civilized? Mandatory school attendance makes no sense to Huck Finn. And so why would you want a civilized society? But moreover, when we look at the hypocrisy of civilized society, we're looking at the degraded rules of the society that justify the logic of the boy. Uh, you have to remember he has a drunk, abusive father who gets to keep the custody of him because he's his natural father, but Huck's drunk and abusive father cannot take care of him. It doesn't make any sense to Huck. The injustice of slavery that keeps Jim from Jim's actual family. Uh, we don't understand why, in, in Huck's mind, why Jim should be separated from his family. Uh, seemingly good people are prejudiced slave owners. They seem to be quite well educated, they seem to be quite well off, but Huck doesn't understand why then they would own other people. And then terrible acts usually go unpunished while lesser crimes lead to severe punishment. In Huck's mind, uh, some of the things like him not attending school or why he has to stay with his dad are absolutely terrible in his mind, whereas these huge acts, the, the bigger acts of society, such as racial prejudice, such as that Jim is being kept from his family, um, why would those get such severe punishment? And then we'll take a look at motifs. Motifs are recurring structures, contrasts, or literary devices that help to develop and form the themes. Uh, with the motif of childhood, remember your major character, the man who is telling you the narration, is a child. So your first motif is childhood. Huck's youth is an important factor in his moral education. He's open-minded enough to undergo the kind of development that Huck does. He is growing, and therefore, he's more open to learning. Another motif is all of the lies and the cons that we see. Not only is Huck Finn himself full of malicious lies and scams, uh, we, we see that they actually hurt a number of people. The sense of superstitions and folk beliefs. Uh, Huck has a tendency to try and not believe them, but he's with Jim quite a bit, and Jim believes a wide range of superstitions and folk tales. Now, he's reluctant to believe them at first, but then many of the beliefs have some basis in reality, and so Huck starts to believe in some of these folk superstitions. And then, of course, we have because it's a satire, we will have parodies of popular romance novels. Now, the story is full of people who base their lives on romantic literary models and stereotypes of various kinds. Now, Tom Sawyer will make a, a cameo in Huck Finn, and Tom Sawyer, for example, in this story, bases his life and actions on adventure novels. Life should be an adventure. You should live your life out the way that you see them in novels. The conflict and climax of our story, our major conflict, Huck has an internal struggle with his deformed conscience. Now remember, climax is the point in the story where the protagonist's conflict is resolved. We have to have a conflict, and then it needs to be resolved. Well, the climax of Huckberry Finn is when Huck decides to steal Jim out of slavery from the Phelps farm. It goes against Huck's own moral code, and he says he will, quote, go to hell for this. But it's also in spite of the fact that he believes he'll suffer in hell for it. In fact, he's trying to help Jim find his family and get his freedom. So there's a sense of moral confusion. And then finally, we have the major symbol of the Mississippi River. Now, in Huck Finn, the river symbolizes freedom, and it becomes symbolic of Huck's journey to discover his natural virtue. The current determines the direction of the raft, as well as Huck's life at the moment. Now, there's a major contrast between life on the river and life on the shore, because life on the river is uncivilized, and yet it's peaceful and easy. It's not without, totally, without, without danger, but life on the shore where civilization is can be cruel, authoritarian, hypocritical, and reflective of what Twain called the damned human race. So life on the raft is a paradox. Even though they're confined to a small space on the raft, 
How can Jim experience greater freedom on the raft? Thanks so much for stopping by, guys. Uh, if, you could, if you could leave me a like or comment on what else you'd like to see, I'd gladly uh, help. And if you like the channel, please don't forget to subscribe.